Good morning, Merry Christmas, and welcome to Concordia. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, how he would humble himself to be born as a babe in a manger. Heavenly Father, we know that his birth means our salvation, for he was not just born, he also died on a cross in our place for our sins. Heavenly Father, as we celebrate the birth of your Son and our Savior, we give you thanks for this most precious gift, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Merry Christmas. It's good to see all of you today. I hope that you've had a good celebration so far, and I pray that this day is blessed as well, especially as we spend this time together in worship of our newborn Savior and King, Jesus Christ. A couple of things that I want to mention. When you came in, you received a worship guide, and on the inside of that worship guide are some announcements, some things that are coming up. Would you be sure and take a look at that at some point? Uh, there's some things with regard to New Year's Eve services, uh, a youth stars retreat for our high school young people that is a, an extremely special event, a great time to grow in faith and grow in relationships with other Christian young people, uh, and then uh, an opportunity to be connected to us in social media. And so please take a look at those items. I'd also ask you to make use of that tab on the end of your worship guide. The front side is for worship attendance, and the back side is for prayer requests. And uh, members, you know what to do with that, but if you're a guest with us this morning, would you be sure and fill that out? We want to know that you're here. Take just a minute and put that information down for us. And then on the back side, we would love to lift up your prayers. Just be sure and let us know. If it's confidential, check that box so that we handle it in an appropriate way. Now, dear friends, before we continue with our worship, will you stand and greet the people nearby? Wish them a Merry Christmas. gathered here to do this morning, to adore our newborn King, who is Christ the Lord, and so we begin in His name, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God's Word tells us that even as we gather to adore our newborn King, we do not always obey our King's commands. 
We sin and we go our own ways, and so we take a moment to confess our sins before our King. As we do so, I'd invite you to kneel, or you can also remain seated. We confess our sins to God. Almighty God, we confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unbelief. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have done. We take a moment of silence to confess those sins which trouble us in our hearts. When an angel appears to some shepherds near Bethlehem on that Christmas night, the angel has a glorious message in Luke chapter 2. He says, today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. That is the good news of Christmas that is born to us a Savior, a Savior who can give us grace, a Savior who can wash our sins away, a Savior who can forgive us because of our Savior Jesus. We have the promise that our sins have been wiped clean in God's name, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. Scripture reading we share today is from the Gospel of John. We read from the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite you to join me today as we make common confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe. take this time to welcome those of you that are guests with us here today. We're really glad that you could join us to worship the Christ this day on Christmas Day. 
We have some ministers of welcome that will be stepping out into the aisles. They have little packets of information about our ministries here at Concordia. If you're new here and you'd like to receive one of those, simply raise your hand and they'll be happy to bring one of those to you. Also, following our service today, we invite you to stop by our Welcome Center. We have a small gift that we'd like to give you today, just a remembrance of your visit with us here. And also, if you're a part of our family of faith here at Concordia and you see somebody new around you today, be sure and welcome them. We continue our Christmas morning worship by going to our Lord in prayer. As we do so, I'd invite you to kneel, or you can also remain seated where you are. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for that glorious mystery and miracle that the Word, your Son, became flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. Father, we know that because Jesus came to this world, he encountered sin and darkness he encountered pain and even death on a cross, and yet, Father, we know that he did it for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for that marvelous miracle of salvation that you work in us through your Son. Father, as people who trust in you, we turn to you for all of our cares, concerns, and needs. Father, on this day, we know that even as we remember that your Son brought joy to the world, there are still stains of sin because of human sinfulness because of the devil. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would be with those who are struggling, maybe because of illness, maybe because of a broken relationship, maybe because they have loved ones who they're separated from on this very special day. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bring peace to the hearts of people who need it, even when the world feels very shaky. Father, we ask you to be with our nation this morning, be with her leaders, be with President Obama, be with all of those who serve in governmental offices. On this day, we're especially mindful of our troops, especially those who are off in foreign lands protecting our country. Father, we pray that you would protect them and bring them home to us safely and quickly. Heavenly Father, on this day of family and friends, may we always be pointed toward the most important thing that this day has to offer. It's the greatest gift that this world has ever known. It's your Son, Jesus Christ, and it's in his name that we pray this morning. We also pray as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on our earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please stand. John 1.14 says, The Word became flesh, and He made His dwelling among us. You know, the promise of Holy Scripture is that Jesus still dwells among us, and He gives to us His own body and His own blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That is what we are about to receive from this altar. And in preparation for such a sacred gift, we are called upon by Scripture to examine ourselves, our hearts, our lives, and our motives, and repent of our sinfulness knowing and believing that here we receive the remedy for our sins because we receive Jesus. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Take and eat, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after the supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, and he said to them, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is my blood of the New Testament, poured out for you 
for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Welcome to the Lord's table. You may be seated.
the promise and glory of Christmas is that our God would take on human flesh and become one of us so he could be with us to save us. That is what we receive from this altar. We receive our God, his son's body and his son's blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That brings joy to our life and to our hearts in our God's name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christmas and uh, tell you how delighted I am to be able to spend this morning's worship with you. We've had a tremendous celebration, beginning with our Advent services and continuing on through our drive through Nativity, and last night the family service and the pageant and the candlelight service, and then today, and the music, by the way, is awesome. Thank you very much to all of you uh, being up early and ready to go. Vicki, you were here with, uh, with the rest of us at 11 o'clock last night, but it sounds fresh and wide awake. Thank you. You know, one of the things that I love about God's Word is that the stories that we read, these stories that are life-changing and powerful, these intersections between Almighty God and people, they're real stories about real people. I say that because sometimes, you know, we think about we think about these stories, like the Christmas story, and we, we paint these pictures, these, these ideas of these people as if they're superhuman, as if they never make mistakes, as if they're not really like us, when in fact, God goes out of his way to point out that they are exactly like us. Even Jesus, in Hebrews, it tells us that Jesus is exactly like us, except he's the only one who never sinned. And what I love about God's Word is to think about these people, to take a step back from all of the romantic pictures and all of the images that maybe we've grown up with and all of the, the pageantry, step back and think about the real people. What were they like? How did they react? So, for example, when I, 
when I think about those shepherds, remember those shepherds, those, those stinky, dirty, smelly shepherds? And not only were they unkempt, they were uncouth. And not only were they uncouth, they weren't very nice guys. They were known as liars and thieves and criminals. And so when I love I loved to think about those shepherds when all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, when they think everything is peaceful, it's their time of the day when all of their darkness is covered in darkness and suddenly an angel appears. I mean, when it says they were terrified, yeah, you get the point. Well, you know, this morning I want to think about two of the people that we really have a tendency to idealize. Mary and Joseph. Because as I think about this, I, I ponder in my mind, God entrusted Mary and Joseph to not only care for his child. Now just think about that for a minute. You know, I know some families that have never had a babysitter because they don't trust anybody else with their kids. Think about this. God is sending his son, but it's not just his son. It is the one with the most important mission in all of the universe for all time. His well-being, his development and growth, his, his ability to survive childhood in a time when it was pretty tough to do and to arrive at the cross was the most central and most important thing ever. And he entrusts these two people out of all of the people in the world to care for his son. They must have been pretty special. I mean, all of the reality of their being sinful and flawed and broken just like we are, all of that notwithstanding, they still had to be the cream of the crop. You know, this morning, I want to think about Mary and Joseph, and I want to think about them as Christmas wrapping. It's really what they were, right? Mary literally, her body was wrapping the Christ child, and then as he is born on this Christmas day, their love and their family wraps that child, provides his environment to grow up. So let's talk about Mary for a minute. Who is she? You know, what do, we, what do we know about her? What do we know about her qualifications? In Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 26, it says, In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now that's not a lot to go on, is it? But the things that we can pick up on this are, are, number one, she was virtuous in that she had not compromised herself physically or sexually. She hadn't succumbed to those temptations. We gain the, the realization that she was highly favored of God. Can we put that picture back up of Mary? You know, this is a picture from the, the Nativity story. And as I shared with the congregation last night, I love that movie because I think they do a great job. While there are things that are, are inaccurate, they try hard to stick to the biblical story. And they have a beautiful portrayal of Mary and Joseph. And so think about this Mary. Mary is, is a, a, probably a young high school student. She was probably 13, 14, 15 years old, just a girl. But you know, as I think about her, and I think about the things that would, would make her highly favored by God, she was probably kind and considerate and patient. She was probably the kind of person who went out of her way to, to make the people around her, her, their lives better. She probably had time for everyone, was willing to help wherever she was needed. She was probably devoted to her faith and her God. So when I think about that, I, I think about some of, the, some of the young high school girls in our congregation 
that when you, you think about them or when you see them doing their thing, going about their life, you, you think to yourself, man, there is a special young lady. Mary would have been a, a darling of the congregation, would have been one of those people that, that everybody loved, everybody wanted to be around her, and everybody could not wait for the day when she would get married, she would marry Joseph, and they would begin to form a family, and they would be ideal parents, and they could not wait to celebrate life with this young girl as she matures into motherhood. What about Joseph? We don't know a lot about Joseph, but we do have a little bit from the Scriptures. The Scriptures tell us that Joseph was pledged to be married to Mary, but it says before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. So first of all, Joseph is a righteous man. That means that, that he did the right things all the time. And he did the right things for the right reason. This is one of those pillar guys in a community. This is one of the people, one of the men, if he were in our congregation, he'd be an elder and he would serve and he would do things faithfully and well. He would love his family. He would love his church. He would do whatever he could do to help other people. When you had business dealings with him, he was fair and right and would always, always make a situation right to the best of his ability. He's devoted to his God. Not just in a, not just in a go-to-church kind of a way. He's devoted to his God every single day. And that devotion to his God has created a kindness. Because you realize when it says that, that what Mary's discovered to be with child and it's not his baby, he has a right to expose her publicly, to humiliate her. He even has the right to have her stoned, put to death for her unfaithfulness. But he doesn't do that. Not only does he not want to, to put her to a torturous death, he doesn't want to embarrass her. Even in his heartbroken condition, even in a moment where he might feel a, a sense of vengeance at, at the betrayal he suffered, he wants to take care of this quietly and just move on. What's that tell you about his kindness? About the gentleness of his spirit? I think these are two pretty special people. You know, I mentioned that I want to think of them as Christmas wrapping. I thought it might be interesting to have a, a little Christmas wrapping quiz this morning. And so I've got four categories of Christmas wrappers, and I'm wondering which one you fall into, because really I don't think there are any other, other categories. Uh, but how many of you, first of all, how many of you have opened Christmas presents already? Okay, anybody still waiting? Oh, man. This is the patient congregation, right? <laughs> all right, well, well, let's just kind of go through these categories, all right? And, and I want you to sort of think which one you are, and then I'm going to ask you to, to vote and let me know which one you are. So category number one is the picture-perfect wrapper. Now, that doesn't mean that you can beatbox and, and do a, you know, none of that. This means that every fold is perfectly symmetrical. This means that the paper looks like it should be photographed. In fact, you really ought to take a picture of the package and give it as a gift. The bow's immaculate. That's the picture-perfect wrapper. Okay, don't elbow anybody here. Category number two, the no one will notice wrapper. Here's the thing about the no one will notice wrapper. Your packages still look awesome. But if the picture perfect wrapper should examine your package, they would be appalled. <laughs> there is not symmetry on the end of each package. There's not a perfect fold that overlaps and the, and the, the flowers and the designs, they do not match up exactly. But still, to the average gift receiver, they're not going to notice. 
you're pretty good. Now we sort of fall off the table. Because we have category three, which is the just plain sloppy rapper. And the just plain sloppy rapper is the person who, if you get paper around it and tape and it holds until you open the presents, it's just getting torn off anyway, for Pete's sakes. What does it matter? Just sort of, sort of, you tend to use a lot of paper because you have no time for folds. You just want to sort of bunch it up and tie it together and stick it under the tree. Category four is the why bother wrapper. Your Christmas tree is adorned with Target bags and Walmart bags and you get the idea? And sometimes when you order stuff from Amazon, you just slide the Amazon box right underneath the tree. And here's your point. You are eco-friendly. Plus, you have no time. I mean, you're busy, and you're volunteering, you're doing all this stuff. And as the, as the sloppy rapper says, it's just getting torn off anyway. Why go to all that trouble, all that time, all that expense, and you can save a few trees? Get the idea? Okay, so let's take a look at the categories. Category number one. How many of you will own up to being picture-perfect, obsessive-compulsive rappers? All right. Some of you don't surprise me a bit. Yeah, I saw that coming. All right, how about the no one will notice rappers? That's probably a pretty big group. Okay. How about the sloppy rappers? Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And how about the ever popular why bother rappers? Okay, yeah, you know what? At least they admit it, right? Now, now, here's the thing. First of all, I hope that that little bit of confession, it feels good to your soul. I, I, I really can't do absolution because I have no idea what I'm absolving. But, but here's the thing. Have you ever noticed, no matter what your style of rapping, whether you are picture perfect or whether you are no one will notice or whether you are sloppy or even if you're the why bother style rapper, at the end of the present opening session, there is still a pile of trash, isn't there? It's amazing. I mean, in, in fact, you know, at, at our house, we actually pull a garbage bag out because if, if you don't get that stuff out of the way, somebody's going to trip and fall. Isn't that the interesting thing? No matter how you wrap presents, even if you don't wrap them at all, just the packaging itself makes a mountain of garbage that needs to be thrown away. Now, here's the interesting thing. When you think about Mary and Joseph, these two wonderful, well-respected, highly admired, beloved people in their community, for them to become the wrapping for Christmas, for the Christ, they have to be willing to take all of that, all of their reputation, all that they are, and have it thrown away. What do I mean, right? Well, think about Mary. Instead of being that adored young girl that everybody wants their kids to be like, that precious darling of the congregation, and everybody can't wait to celebrate her marriage and to watch her grow into motherhood, now everyone is dismayed. That this girl, she's compromised herself. And not only has she compromised her morality, but she's betrothed to this wonderful man who clearly loves her and is devoted to her. How could she possibly betray him? And now when she walks down the street, nobody will even look at her. Her friends won't talk to her. Their parents tell them to stay away, have nothing to do with her. She is an outcast. She's despised. She's gone from being the darling to being despised. Do you realize she did that willingly? Willingly? 
The Lord is with you, the angel says. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? I mean, imagine this young girl. How can this possibly be? I'm a virgin. I have never been with a man. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Do you think Mary knows what's going to happen? I think she knows full well what's going to happen. And her response from this profound faith of a young girl says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And with those words, that dear girl takes her reputation, takes her her love in the community takes essentially her life and throws it away to serve her God. Joseph, you think it's any different for him? Joseph, this, this righteous man, this guy who always does what's right, who always does what's right for the right reason, it says, after Joseph had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream that, that is considered putting Mary away quietly. And he said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Do you think that Joseph, this man who does what is right, this man who knows the law, this man who knows his community, this man who basks in a stellar reputation, do you think he doesn't know what the people are going to say? Do you think he doesn't realize that he's going to be, go from being considered a righteous man and a pillar of the community to again being despised? Lacking morality? Taking advantage. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife, and he gave him the name Jesus. Took all of his worldly fame, all of his, all of his respect, and all of that righteous perception, and he threw it all away out of faithfulness to his God. That's because when, when it comes down to Christmas, it's, it's really not the wrapping that matters. It's the gift. The gift is what is most important. That gift that comes into our world. That's why we call our drive through nativity the gift. Because it wasn't Mary that was most important or Joseph that was most important. While they are honorable, wonderful, beloved people, the reality is that in that moment, in their culture, in their time, in their life, they had to be willing to give themselves away, to throw themselves away in order to deliver the gift that would bring salvation for our souls. Hope to our lives. But you know, that's just one perspective. Because there's another perspective here. Do you realize that? It's God's perspective. 
And what's interesting is that when you see this from God's perspective, everything changes. The lesson for this morning was from John chapter 1. What's interesting about John chapter 1 is there are no shepherds, there are no mangers, there, are no sh- uh, there is no Mary and Joseph, there are no wise men. There's just the Word. In the beginning, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And then jumping down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. But that gift came into our world and he took on human flesh. But, but make no mistake, from God's perspective, that Savior Jesus who took on human flesh, that Savior Jesus who from a human standpoint was wrapped in his mother and father, Mary and Joseph, clothed in their love, the reality is that from God's perspective, he didn't come to be wrapped, he came to be the wrapping. He came to wrap your life and my life. What do I mean? I mean that we must be clothed in His righteousness. We must be covered in His blood for the forgiveness of our sins. God sent His Son not thinking about Him as a tiny baby or as a young boy. He thought of Him as a Savior, a conqueror, a victor, sent into this world to die on the cross and in the process shed His blood and exchange our filthy sin. For his robes of righteousness. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 61 foretells this. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. You understand that Jesus, when he became the wrapping, just as Mary was willing to throw away her reputation and her standing in the community, and Joseph was willing to, to throw away his righteousness and his, his notoriety, his fame in the community, perhaps give up his business, Jesus, when he became our wrapping, threw himself away as well. As he stretched out his arm, and was nailed to a cross. But we need to go back for just a second. Because if if Jesus is the wrapping, then I don't want you to miss the fact that from God's perspective, in the Christmas story, there is another gift. And that gift is you. God sent His Son to wrap that which was precious, a precious gift to our God. And that's you. The Savior came into the world on Christmas in order to redeem that gift that was was holy and precious to God, to redeem that masterpiece that He had planned from before the world was, the foundation of the world was laid, that gift that He intends to hold close and to love for the rest of eternity. You. In fact, when you think about it, isn't that exactly what the angel told those stinky, smelly, thieving shepherds. That no matter what they had done, no matter who they were, no matter how far they had fallen, no matter what mountain of mistakes beleaguered their lives, Christmas was for them. Do not be afraid the angel said. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. You know, dear friends, 
I certainly am not a candidate for Joseph's spot. Men, I'm guessing you're not either. And ladies, as lovely as you are, I'm guessing you're probably not candidates for Mary's spot. We've got mistakes, and we've got shortcomings, and we've got failures. We've got doubts and weaknesses. And we've got a whole record of messing up. But this Christmas morning, we need to recognize that in spite of all of our frailties and all of our sin, the precious gift of Christmas to our God is that which was wrapped in Christ. You. As you leave this place today, my prayer is that you walk out of here recognizing that whatever you struggle with, wherever you falter, wherever you have fallen, the reality is that God has reached into this world at Christmas and he has claimed you as his own. Whatever is creating a distance between you and him, whatever you are holding in your heart that, that causes you to struggle in your faith, you can let that go. Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him, through that precious wrapping of the Savior, that you and I might be saved. Let's pray. Kind Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your love poured out at Christmas. That you would consider people like us a precious gift, it's absurd. And that's exactly what you told the shepherds, though, Lord. That born this day is a Savior, a Redeemer for them, for us. And so, Lord, allow us to bask in that knowledge and to draw, draw close to you with confidence. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And as you leave this place, may you go back to your Christmas celebrations and shine like stars in the universe. You are God's gift. And may you share that message of life. Amen. Merry Christmas and God bless you.